to have a look at, at that. So um, the next speaker is uh, Viola Sordini, who is a LIGO a member, and uh, she's, um, uh, she's working in Lyon. She's uh, also a researcher in, uh, on um, compact binary coalescence data um, analysis, and um, I leave uh, uh, her the floor. Thanks, Viola. Yes, hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me fine. We tested at the beginning, in principle. Um, yes. so I'm, very, I'm very happy to uh, talk to all of you here, just to say that I'm connected from a study hub, so I'm in the same room with some a handful of participants to this workshop in Lyon. Um, yeah, so I, I will try to talk about the science we do with this gravitational wave observations. Um, and, okay, I can change the slides, that's good. Um, so, um, I guess on some introduction, I can be fast. Uh, according to Einstein's general relativity, gravitational waves are ripples in the space-time that propagate at the speed of light. Um, and they cause the space itself to stretch in a direction while it's compressed on the other. Um, what we'll try to see together is that uh, those observation are very, observations are very interesting because they allow us to probe gravity in unprecedented conditions. Uh, indeed, although gravity is something we experience in our everyday life macroscopically, uh, it is kind of hard to test it uh, among the fundamental interactions. Uh, it is quite hard to, to test gravity uh, in strong fields because it is actually very weak. Um, and so gravitational waves are very interesting per se uh, uh, because they inform us about gravity, but also we will see that they really are a new messenger from the universe. So our observations have many implications in different fields uh, of physics. Um, okay, so uh, there are many systems that can lose energy through gravitational waves. Uh, we uh, And we try to search for many different signals. We typically uh, divide the signals in two broad categories, the transient ones and the longer duration ones. Um, so the transient ones are, for example, the gravitational wave signals that are emitted by a coalescence of two binary objects or the ones emitted from a supernova explosion. Uh, and then longer duration signals are more, for example, gravitational wave emission from pulsars that are highly um, fastly rotating neutron stars or what we call stochastic gravitational wave background that is kind of a superposition of many unresolved sources that are too far away to be detected individually. So I just want to say today I will really focus on the first category. So the compact binary coalescences signals or CBC, an acronym that you've heard a lot. Uh, but really, really, I wanted to stress that the physics program of the International Gravitational Wave Detector Network is really wider than that. So we, we do cover many other searches. The reason why we focus on CBC today is that um, I focus on CBC today is that these are the events that we have observed until now. Um, so what are these compact objects? The ones that we consider for our, because these are the ones that we can detect as we discussed in the previous days, are neutron stars and black holes. Those are the remnant of a normal stellar evolution of a main sequence high mass star. Uh, that depending on its mass will will uh, leave a, a, a neutron star or a black hole. Um, so these are um, a, a neutron star is uh, mostly composed of neutrons, hence its name, uh, with a crust of heavy nuclei and a hot plasma atmosphere. Uh, and then depending on the theories, there might be some unknown exotic matter in the in the, in its core. Uh, it is. Just to tell you how compact this object is, you can imagine that a neutron star that would have a mass 1.4 higher than the sun, so 1.4 times the mass of the sun, typically we use the solar masses as a unit of measure, uh, would have a radius of just 10 kilometers that you can compare with the, I don't know, 700,000 kilometers for the sun, for example. Uh, it means this is very dense, so just one teaspoon of a neutron star would weigh 100 million tons. Um, Okay, so the, the neutrons are um, uh, do not collapse gravitationally because of some uh, nuclear forces and 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 some uh, nuclear nuclear nucleon pressure, uh, new, neutron pressure. But uh, when th this system works up to a let's say limit mass, which is somewhere between two and two point five 
solar masses. When the mass is higher than that, the, there is a gravitational collapse. So all the matter collapses into a region of space-time with extremely intense gravitational field. That is what we call a black hole. So this is like a singularity in, in space-time. Um, and it's called the black hole. It is black because uh, neither matter or light can escape its gravitational attraction. And these objects, as we've seen already, they can have masses between somewhere around five uh, times the mass of the sun up to millions or billions of times the mass of the sun uh, for, for example, the black holes that are at the center of galaxies. Uh, so we will talk about binary systems today. So uh, we consider binary systems with all the possible combination of these compact objects. So uh, when I say binary system is two, two objects that are orbiting around each other and then losing energy through gravitational waves and then merging. Um, so we consider systems where I have two neutron stars, which we call binary neutron stars, so BNS, then mixed system with a neutron star in a black hole, these are NSBHs, and then binary black hole system, so BBHs. So you, you will see this, uh, these acronyms a lot in the, in the presentation. Okay, so to uh, calculate the form the shape of the gravitational wave signal that we expect to be emitted from the system, we assume general relativity. Um, we have different techniques uh, to calculate the signal depending on the phase of the of the uh, of the spiral. So you see this in the plot on the left. Um, you have a small sketch. So you have a first phase that is called in spiral, where the two objects are far away. In that case, we have an analytic approximation uh, for the waveform, which is basically a perturbation uh, expansion in a small uh, parameter, where the small parameter is V over C, so the, the speed of these objects divided by the speed of light. When the two objects get closer at a, an, at a merger, we use numerical relativity, and then we use some perturbation theory to describe the ring down of these excited objects that is created. Um, so in the plot in the center, you will recognize the amplitude spectral density. You're now expert about that. Again, this is describing the typical strain I will observe in my detectors just from noise as a function of the frequency. So the lower this is, the better, the more sensitive is my detector. And you have three um, curves, color curves for three different signals. On the right, you also see the time evolution of the strain for these three signals. So um, the basic idea is that a signal must be higher than that for me to see it. And uh, so the signal, the shape of the signal would really depend on the properties of the objects that were involved in the coalescence. Uh, so really broadly speaking, uh, more massive systems will give uh, gravitational wave signals with higher amplitude, but they will also enter our frequency the, the band of frequency where we are sensitive for shorter time. So a more massive system will give a shorter signal in my detector and the higher amplitude. And the low mass system will give a longer signal but a lower amplitude. And also for fixed masses and spins and everything, uh, so the same signal, we the, the amplitude of a signal decreases with the inverse of the distance. So not the inverse of the square of the distance. Uh, we're really sensitive to the amplitude and not to the power, which is something maybe a bit unusual. And it's good because we have seen that this amplitude is very small. Um, okay, so I have to discuss a couple of milestone observations. Um, let me first start with the first observation. This was in 2015 and it was really groundbreaking, the first uh, BBH merger. Uh, and so this was a great success for both general relativity, but also for the LIGO experiments. You recognize here the, the plot of the strain in, in time and then the frequency versus time um, uh, plots. Uh, I don't think I have to stay long on this slide because you've actually played with this exact data during the tutorial. So I guess you're your expert on that. Um, a second milestone observation is the uh, first observation of a coalescence of uh, a binary neutron star system in 2017, and also the only, uh, for the moment, gravitational wave uh, detection with an electromagnetic counterpart. So this is GW170817. Um, you see in the middle the signals in the three detectors. In 2017, Virgo had joined the RAM, and as described by Soichiro just before, uh, our detectors are not sensitive to all the portions of the sky exactly in the same way. 
uh, which means that having different detectors in different locations actually helps a lot in localizing the signal in the sky. This was the case for Virgo. So you see on the right, the sky localization. Um, light, light green is just LIGO and, and dark green is LIGO plus Virgo. And of course, sky localization is super important if you want to tell astronomers, go, go look if you have an electromagnetic counterpart. Um, so this uh, was the birth of the multi-messenger astronomy with gravitational waves. Indeed, um, I'm not going through the details, but you see on the plot on the left, um, every line is a different, um, let's say, kind of observation or different wavelengths. And, and then uh, you have written all the, all the observatories that participated to the observation and every colored bar is one given observation and the x-axis is time. So you see the gravitational wave signal here, the gamma ray bars that was associated to the 2017 BNS, uh, just 1.7 seconds later. And then you see that for, for hour, seconds to hours to days, we've been observing the same actual astrophysical event uh, with many, many messengers. So this was really very exciting for the scientific community. It allowed, for example, to study the process of a kilonova and to determine that this is what follows a BNS uh, Coalescence and to study the nucleosynthesis in this kilonova, which gave us new insight on the creation of heavy elements in the universe. We will see later what else we've done with this with this event. Um, so I will now focus on the latest results, which are late from the latest observing run, which we called O3. It was in 2019, 2020. During this run, the searches for CBC signals were really done systematically. So it is cool that I'm the last one, the last speaker in this workshop, because now you actually know all the pieces of the puzzle. So you've heard about the detectors from Victoria. So this produced H of T. You have heard about data quality. Um, it, during O3, the two LIGO and Virgo were included in the data taking. That's why I only have the example for three, but you know, it, it is easy to imagine how this would be with four detectors with Kagra as well. Um, so you heard about the qualities from Ronaldas, then the CBC search pipelines will ingest this information and, uh, you know, expert uh, about much filtering because you heard from Kustav and you know that this naturally gives us this signal to noise ratio. Uh, then the question we ask is, okay, given the candidate with a signal to noise ratio, how often I expect to get a, such a candidate just from noise? And the answer to this question is what we call the false alarm rate. And so this is what we use to determine if a candidate is um, significant. It, the false alarm rate or FAR is not actually the end of the story. If you open the catalog, so you will see another quantity that is called P astro. That's the probability of being of astrophysical origin. And I mean, we can discuss more in the questions, but just very broadly speaking, the FAR is mostly informed about the noise, while P astro also assumes a population for the signal. So that's a probability, it's between zero and one. It's, it's also e easier to, to read. Um, okay, so we have a list of our candidates, significant candidates, then the we take the time, the data around their GPS time, and we feed this to this very expensive Bayesian inference analysis that you've just heard about from Soishiro. And this will give us a set of posteriors, okay, uh, for these candidates, and what we will talk about in my presentation is what we do with them. And we will see that together, we will use them to understand gravity, astrophysics, nuclear physics, cosmology. Okay, so um, CBC detections have really become a routine of GW astronomy. So 2015, just one detection was like a, worth a Nobel Prize, and now we're kind of getting used to that, right? So this is the table of the detections that we had starting from 2015. And here, the run, 2019, 2020, or three run starts. So you have all these events. We have we now have around 90 uh, significant detections. Um, well, you can look at the table, maybe zooming offline, but each square is a um, is an event, and then the rounds are telling you the masses and the nature of the objects. You also see how the the detections have been accumulating as a function of. Uh, on the x-axis, you have like a proxy for our sensitivity, and all of these events are from the latest run. Um, so we typically um, collect all these events in our like flagship um, uh, publications that are called, called Gravitational Waves Transient Catalogs, so GWTC. This 
contain a list of events with the significance and then contain the parameter estimation information. So you see here what a catalog abstract looks like. And these are exactly the same events that you find in the event portal that Eric uh, described uh, on Monday. So typically the catalog will contain um, some plots for posteriors. You, as you know, you can also download posteriors and, and play around with them. Uh, so you see here on the right, for example, one dimensional posteriors for different uh, observables, mass of the first and second object, mass ratio, effective spin, which is kind of mass weighted spin, and then the luminosity distance. Every line is a, signal so a candidate is called gw for gravitational waves then you have the year month and day and then you have the hour hours minutes and seconds in utc uh, here you have similarly the 90 percent confidence regions from the posteriors in two-dimensional planes so effective spin versus chirp mass this is a reduced mass so if you're just um, introduced and then mass ratio versus total mass so you see how our events are distributed in the parameter space. You see, for example, we, we have much more at high mass. We mostly observe BBHs. We did have one additional BNS so during 03, but uh, 1904 25, unfortunately, with no electromagnetic counterpart, which is maybe not that surprising since this was a bit far away. Um, OK, so let me just some remarkable events from those. Uh, Typically, when we see events that are a bit special, we also have dedicated publications. So we've seen about BBH. BBH is starting from 2015. We've seen about a BNS uh, detection in 2017. But actually, we had to wait until 2020 to have our first observation of a mixed system, so NSBHs. So we, had, we started with two events in 2020. So you see here the sky maps and the dedicated publication. Uh, then I have a couple of events I want to... Um, discuss in particular that also had specific publications. So uh, let's look at this kind of plots, the masses in the stellar graveyard plots. So the y-axis is the mass and the x-axis has no meaning. It's just to have some you know, room for plotting our events. So um, anything that is the green, uh, the, sorry, the yellow points are neutron stars seen by electromagnetic means. The orange points are the neutron stars we see with LIGO and Virgo. And similar for the purple and blue points. These are black holes seen electromagnetically or gravitational wave or with gravitational waves. Um, so you see that there is sort of a mass gap here. So there are not many, uh, many objects observed between, I don't know, 2.5 and 5. So this is something that we, we have seen already that we have a maximum mass for neutron stars, which is around between 2 and 2.5 solar masses. But people typically expected not to have black holes below five solar masses, simply because we didn't observe any. And so we already see that our observations are kind of challenging our understanding of these astrophysical objects, because we have several um, objects that we observe that lie in this mass gap. So for example, this GW1908-14 is a coalescence within a 23 solar mass black hole with a mystery object of, of 2.6 solar masses, you've actually just saw the posterior in Soichiro's talk. So this is like 2.6 plus or minus 0.1, right? So um, so this is either the heaviest neutron star we've ever observed or the lightest black hole. Um, another event is GW1905-21. Um, so I, I told you that uh, black holes are like the remnant of a stellar evolution, but actually um, from our understanding of, of supernova explosion, we cannot really produce two high mass black holes. So in this region, a supernova explosion would uh, undergo a um, mechanism for which there won't be any black hole formation, but the star will be kind of blown away. So 1905-21 is the coalescence of two black holes of 66 and 85 solar masses. And we, it is not clear how we can create this by stellar evolution. So maybe these black holes are themselves the result of a, of a coalescence or they have, have been growing by accretion. So these are uh, like interesting events. So we use this observation to do many things. Let me just go through a list. Um, first of all, we can use them to understand gravity, as we said. Um, let me start with the waveform. I, I told you that we can calculate the waveforms assuming general relativity, but we also try to check if this assumption works. So what we do is, for example, we take our data and then we take our signals that you know, assume general relativity, and then we subtract the signals 
from the data. So we subtract the signals that assume general relativity and we look at what is left. And then we do some residual test and we measure the coherent re residual signal to noise ratio coherent between different detectors. And if our signals really describe all the, you know, all if our waveform really describe all the signal that is on in data, we should be left with something that is consistent with noise. This is what we test on the plot on the right. So in gray, you have what you expect from just noise and in light green, what we observe. So you see that this is consistent. Um, another thing is that we do is here you, on the left, you have again the plot with you know the different phases. I told you that we have different techniques. So we do we redo our analysis, splitting our waveform in two. We take just the in-spiral part and then anything that is post in spiral. And then we analyze the event separately and we determine twice, for example, the mass of the system. And then we go and, and check if the mass that we determine with the two halves of our waveform are consistent. And this is what you see in the plot in the middle. This is the fractional deviation, fractional difference of the mass and the spin. And you see that the difference is consistent with zero. Um, we, do, we also, um, I, I told you that uh, we have an analytical uh, description for this in spiral part. So we also, allow in parameter estimation for some generic modification to the coefficients of this uh, um, of this analytical expansion and we find that all the uh, all the the possible variation are, are consistent with zero um okay so um I told you that GW 170817 was observed in coincidence with a gamma ray burst uh, which was observed within 1.7 seconds so this allowed us for example to constrain the propagation of the speed of GW, so which is something that general relativity predicts to be the speed of light. And we could see that this is consistent with the speed of light within uncertainties. Also, we uh, compare the luminosity distance of the galaxy where this BNS happened as a measure from gravitational waves or from electromagnetic waves. So these two, let's say simple, simple uh, um, measurement alone really put very strong constraints on alternative theories of gravity. So we are really starting to test things that were very hard to test before. So this was very important. Um, another thing that general relativity predicts is the effect of lensing, right? So lensing is, we, we do observe this for light. When light goes through um, uh, a place where there's very strong gravitational field, it can be deflected. So you have here, you have images example images of some um, uh, um, deflection of lights due to lensing. And so we expect the gravitational waves can be lensed as well. So you have here, you know, a coalescence and then a strong gravity fields. And then, for example, you will see twice the image from an event. This is our interferometer. Um, so uh, we didn't detect any lensed events, but we do search for them. And a detection would be, again, a test of general relativity. OK, so we also use this observation to do some astrophysics. Um, in particular, we've seen that we observe, uh, observe signals from astrophysical um, systems. So we can study the signals to understand better the population properties of these compact objects that are involved in our coalescences. Understand the populations uh, means, for example, measuring the merger rates. So this is what you see on the table for BNS, NSBH, and BBH system. These number are rates, which means the number of coalescences that happen per unit volume, per unit time. Um, don't be confused by the many lines. Uh, it turns, turns out that the rate depends on what we assume for the masses. But let's see, for example, the second line, PDB independent. What does 44 mean for BNS? It means that if you take a sphere with a radius of one gigaparsec and you wait for one year, on average, you will have 44 binary neutron star coalescences in them. And similarly, in the same sphere, on average, you will have 22 BBHs, which is kind of weird because I just told you that we mostly observe BBH signals. So this is maybe a question for you. So how comes that? many more BNSs are produced, but I observe less of them. So maybe we can, we can discuss later. Um, okay, we can also learn something about the mass of the objects that are in this binary system. For example, we did study the mass distribution of the few neutron stars we observe in binaries. We see that they are slightly heavier than the galactic neutron stars, and also they're not really peaked around the value. 
Um, but as I told you, mainly we observe BBHs, so we mainly have new insight on the uh, black hole population properties. In particular, you see on the right, right left, the structure, the posterior of the mass of the black holes. So we clearly see this, this distribution has a substructure. There is an accumulation around 35. Actually from subsequent analysis, we also see other one or two accumulation around 10 and 18. Uh, so this is interesting in this, uh, in the paper, uh, the LBK consider different uh, mass, uh, uh, different mass uh, populations that you see a bit drawn here on the left. Um, so this is interesting for people who study population with, we don't have a, a clear understanding of this bump, so we can have some theories, but it clearly informs us about the different uh, formation processes. Um, this is just for mass, but we also uh, look at the spins, as you've seen. So we have evidence of spin precession, uh, which hint to some dynamical formation. Um, so how do this binary system form? And we also start to be able to follow the BBH evolution with redshift because we start to see a bit far away. Um, and this is generally consistent with star formation rate. Uh, so most of our black holes might be of stellar origin, although we've seen, uh, we, we think some of them might not be. So we have several formation processes. Um, we can use this observation going on with the list to explore the extremely dense nuclear matter. So you see on the on the left, this is the phase diagram of you know hadronic uh, matter, and you see temperature versus density, and you know that we do explore this diagram with many different uh, in many different laboratories on Earth, but it is very hard on Earth to test the very high density and low temperature. This is something for which neutron stars are actually invaluable laboratories. We would be unable to do this in a laboratory on Earth, and indeed the neutral star nature will affect its behavior during the coalescence. So in the end, it will change the waveform that we would see in our detectors. So in particular, with gravitational wave, we can measure something that we call tidal deformability, so how stiff the neutron stars are. Um, this is what we did with 170817. This is on the plot on the right. That's the color is giving you the posterior and lambda is this famous tidal deformability. So that's the tidal deformability. It's, it's just a number, it's dimensionless for the first and the second neutron star. And you see that we prefer smaller values, which means the neutron stars were very stiff. And all these lines with names, we don't go through the details, but are different models of neutron stars. So this one um, observation helped to constrain many models. So we have more compact neutron stars than what predicted by these, for example, two models up there. Um, we can also use this observation to constrain cosmology. So you must be familiar with the Big Bang theory, at least for the because of the TV show. Uh, the idea is that the universe is expanding. This is a bit shown in the drawing here. Imagine that the space is the surface of the sphere. This is expanding. So the distance between two points is expanding. The space really is expanding. And this expansion is faster for more far away objects. So um, from Earth, if we look at, uh, um, at something in the sky, we can measure its luminosity distance. This we measure, it's the distance that informs you about the reduction of the flux from a source. So if the universe was Euclidean and not expanding, this would be the distance, like the physical distance. But the universe is expanding, so the light that I receive from a source actually stretches and gravitational waves too. And so we have a redshift, um, uh, we can measure a redshift, which we call Z. So for closed sources, the redshift and the luminosity distance are related by this law um, with this H0, H0 parameter that is the famous, famous Hubble constant. Oh. Wow, <laughs> fire alert. Okay, it was, it was quick. So this H0 describes the rate at which the universe is currently expanding. And it is, as you know, a very active, um, uh, very actively uh, pursued by cosmologists because you see here it is mainly um, um, measured with two different uh, in two different wave ways. You see here the history of the measurements in red and blue, and so lately it looks like there is some tension in this between these two kind of measurements. And this is where gravitational waves can play a role um, because we can help in constraining this H zero parameter. 
So I already told you that gravitational waves allow us to measure the luminosity distance. So if I get, if I have a way to measure the redshift of the galaxy, for example, where my BNS took place, I can constrain H0. So there are different methods to get the redshift. Redshift, let's start with the easy one. Imagine we have an EM counterpart. So I take the redshift from the galaxy information, that's an EM information, and um, I can measure H0. So this, unfortunately, as we say, only happened for the GW170817. And you see the plot that we produced on the right. So that's a plot from 2017 publication. Uh, in colored bars, you have the two uh, measurements that are uh, supposedly in tension, and in blue, the posterior we can get from gravitational waves. So this is consistent with everything, but again, it is just one event. But then what about all the BBHs that we observed, right? We, we, we try to be, you know, smart. So we can do something even if we don't have an electromagnetic counterpart. So first of all, imagine my BBH is very well localized. I can go and look, I can open a galaxy catalog and look what galaxies are there and maybe try to infer the redshift from there. Or also, you heard already yesterday that the masses we observe are actually affected by the redshift. So what we do is that we jointly constrain the cosmological parameters and the source population properties of the BBHs. So you see here again, this is uh, on the x-axis you have H0. In black, you have the curve that you've seen from 2017 and in blue, you have the new posterior we have when we combine the 2017 posterior with, with the best we could do with all the BBHs we observed meanwhile. Okay, so uh, we can also use this observation to do some multi-messenger, what we call triggered searches. So this is searching for GW transient associated with some other observation. So we do this, for example, for gamma ray bursts, what we call GRBs and fast radio bursts, FRBs. So the coalescences of compact objects involving a neutral star have been thought to be associated to gamma ray bars for a long time. And I think we, we had approved a proof of that with 17017. Uh, for fast radio bars, uh, the emission mechanism, mechanism is still unknown, but again, we think this might be related to a coalescences of compact objects involving a neutral star. So um, if we have a detection, we could this could be a hint uh, for their formation processes. Um, for the moment, we don't observe any associated detection apart from 170817. So what we do is that we use the sensitivity that we determine on simulation to have some exclusion distance. This is what you have in the plots below. So this is something like, okay, I made my simulation and if there was such a system here, a system that would give rise to a gravitational wave signal and the gamma ray burst at this distance, then I would have seen it. Since I don't see it, I can say that I exclude it, right? That this is more or less like how it works. And I have a um, final slide. We can also use the CBC techniques to search for you know, new physics, exotic compact objects. Uh, so we do that searching for uh, hypothetical subsolar mass compact objects that are predicted by many models. So this would be compact objects with masses between 0 0.2 and one solar masses. And we can do that because we can use our classic CBC techniques. In our waveforms, we can put masses of 0 0.3, for example, and then we use the match filtering, as we know. Um, for the moment, we have no observation. So again, we put limits on the merger rate uh, based on simulation. So you see the limits here. This is on the x-axis, you, you have the mass of an object that can be subsolar, but goes up to standard masses. And then on the y-axis, an object that is only subsolar. And the numbers are the rates in gigaparsec minus three year minus one that we exclude at 90% confidence level. So these numbers are very important for people who works on model, for example, of, prim of primordial black holes or black holes created from dissipative dark matter. So they come with their theory model and they have to check their models against our observations. So we help them um, uh, constrain their models. Okay, so I am at the end of my presentation. To conclude, our latest observing period was really a big success. And it is kind of a change of gear for our collaboration or uh, international network. So the gravitational wave astronomy is really entering the era of statistics accumulation, at least for the CBC signals. We have, you've heard this many times, a new observation period starting in one week from today uh, with better sensitivities and a longer uh, longer run. So we will expect uh, 
I don't know, a factor two to three times the number of CBC observations. So that's very exciting. Um, already with the ones we had, which are about 90 high probability CBC candidates, we were able to uh, put out many varied scientific results. Uh, Unfortunately, at the moment, we just have one with the electromagnetic counterpart. Uh, we hope we might have a new one, at least another one uh, during the next observation period. Uh, but already what we have helps us to put constraints on sources, populations, and rates. Uh, it allows us to test general relativity and to do some cosmology study. Um, and just a reminder, we do search for non-CBC GW signals. And although we have no evidence for the moment, we are getting better at that. Uh, so this could also be a surprise of the next observing period, maybe the first non-CBC non -CBC observation. And as a general point, the gravitational waves remain a newcomer among the universe messengers. So we still have room for unexpected, which is of course very exciting. So stay tuned. And I'm done with my presentation. Yay, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot, Viola. It was very nice talk. It's very nice to conclude with this positive message and with all this uh, um, science. So uh, so I um, am also in a study hub, So and I have a question here from um, a student. So I will start from a colleague, actually, not a student. So go on, Giacomo. Hi, Viola. Thanks for the presentation. I have a question. So there was a few months ago a um, paper, a nature paper, uh, suggesting a possible association of uh, uh, the binary neutral star merger uh, seen in O3 uh, with a fast radio burst event. I don't know if you have investigated that uh, or if you have uh, any comment on this uh, event. So I was I was not involved in any particular study. Uh, as I heard, this is a possibility. It is not um, so within the collaboration. It is not clear that we are convinced by this by this association, but. Yeah, I guess what I can say is that uh, this confirms that it is very interesting to look, you know, for uh, to to do some triggered searches because when we when we know uh, about another event like a fast radio burst or a gamma ray burst, we can also use. I didn't discuss this here, but we can use some techniques that are a bit more sensitive than the you know usual just match filtering different detectors and then making coincidences. So yeah, I guess this adds to the interest of keep keeping doing these searches. But yeah, I don't have any special insight. But maybe I don't know someone else does uh, either in the in the audience. I don't know. Thanks. So um, I see other question uh, in the chat of Zoom. Okay. So uh, one question is uh, uh, for the BBH. So source redshift estimation, even for lowest volume localization, the number of galaxies would be larger. How do you identify the host galaxies then? Has this been done before? Yes. Uh, no, that's, you're right. And let me go back. So you're, you're referring to this, that what I said, imagine we have Okay, we, we know we have some sky localization for our BBH. We don't have any electromagnetic counterpart. Also, we don't expect that from a BBH. Or, okay, it, it can depend on the surroundings of the of the system, but from an isolated binary black hole system, we don't. Um, so I said, okay, maybe we can just open a galaxy catalog and go see what galaxies are there. And maybe this helps us to infer the redshift. And um, uh, you're right. So first of all, this only works with very precisely localized events. Uh, and still, the galaxies can be many. Our catalogs can be not complete. So we we had actually quite some studies of this kind of hierarchical Bayesian inference that we can do in these cases. Um, what you can do is that you, you have some, you know, for example, priors. For example, we think that it's most likely that a BBH comes from galaxies that are they have a higher luminosity, for example, and we we it is proved that we can fold in this information in a Bayesian inference and get overall a correct result. I should add that, uh, for example, if we take the O3, um, so so we, we do study the systematics of this uh, method. That's what I mean. But uh, I should add that with the O3, um, th this publication uses all events up to O3, and actually, um, I think. This is really, really driven by the second um, method, the ones with population. So we only had, we we had maybe one event that was 
localized well enough so that this first galaxy catalog um, method was really making a difference. But overall, what we do here is mostly constraining the um, the IH0 with BBHs, so with what we call dark sirens, using population. But I mean, all your points are valid, and we try to you know to take them into account and to have an understanding of the systematics. Uh, okay. Uh, so there are other questions. I'm trying to. There are many questions, <laughs> so I'm <laughs> trying to disentangle. Yeah, but if Viola, you don't see them because they send directly to me. That's ah, what okay. I'm so I'm trying to read them. So um, I think uh, one can uh, can. Uh, uh, one question that can be useful for in general the audience is what kind of non CBC signals that are possible and it is possible is it possible for us to search them in the available open data and through the technique technique techniques we learned here okay so um the the kind of this is annoying. Okay, the kind of well, okay, but just a drawing. We do search for many things. So you can search for um, okay, that's the problem with CBCs. When you search for something very particular, you have seen with much filtering that you you are that's a super far, powerful technique when you know exactly the waveform, but somehow if you search for something very particular, you only you only find what you're looking for, right? So people sometimes are worried, like imagine we have an, another signal, a different signal. It could be a supernova signal. It could also be a coalescence with objects that are, for example, uh, orbits that are very eccentric. There might be some things that we would miss with our waveforms. And the thing is the LDK would not miss them because we do look for other signals. So in the transient world, for example, looking for supernovae or any, transient signal that we are not sure how to model. We have, for example, other searches. So this won't be the, um, uh, the techniques discussed by Kustab yesterday, so the match filtering. These searches are more, um, they don't assume any model for the signal, but they basically look for some excess in the power in the data. So you can imagine, you've been looking at, it's kind of what you do with your eyes when you make Q transform um, frequency versus time scans. So we do look at these scans and then we analyze them in tiles and we try to see if there is really some excess of power with respect to what we expect from noise. And so these are what we typically call burst searches. Um, that can be, so they can be sensitive to, to uh, some, some signals that would escape our match filtering. And by the way, burst searches did find many events during O3, but all of them were also found by CBC searches. So they work and uh, for the moment they don't add anything, but if tomorrow we have a supernova, we will miss it with the, with match filtering because we don't have the waveform and bar searches will uh, hopefully see it. So that's for the transient. Um, for the longer duration signals, for example, something that we, uh, okay, we, we might hope uh, to see during O4, I don't know, it would be a first, uh, GW emission from a neutron star. So neutron stars, you remember that uh, the a system must be uh, non-symmetric non to emit gravitational waves. So this is kind of, sometimes we say, yeah, we are constraining how high are the mountains on a neutron star. So any non-symmetric feature on a neutron star would uh, imply some gravitational wave emission. So this is something that people search for and we are getting really good at that. So we are really hitting the sensitivity limits where we could see something, it of course depends on the structure of the neutron star. And these signals are very different from the ones we discussed. They would be typically um, emission at a given frequency related to the neutron star rotation frequency. And um, so, and they will be persistent. So these ones are not happening at some times, but they are signals that um, they get more and more significant while you accumulate data. So, and you, sh you should see a signal at a given frequency. So these are also, if you can imagine it's all another world of uh, det detector uh, understanding and noise hunting because all these lines we have in our PSDs, typically they will annoy a lot these kind of searches. So I guess you, of course, you can do these searches on open data because you have the, you know, you have H of T and the uh, data quality information, but, um, and in, I guess you can, search for some uh, example of open source codes, but it is true that the workshop, uh, unless I, I see that we have a non-CBC example today, 
but okay, the workshop workshop is is mainly giving example examples about CBC. But I mean, all the data is is public, so yes, you you can in in principle. Yes, uh, so, and uh, so just to add, uh, in the if you go in the guosc.org website, there is a, a section that is called software that collects all the open software that is available. And so as Viola said, if you scroll there, you can look for some open example. But as you can imagine, for reason of space and uh, needed to space in the, from human in the sense of time needed to run and organize the workshop is impossible to um, uh, describe in detail all the other methods so it's a choice to describe the one that uh, have uh, given the, um, the, 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 the 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 discoveries until now, even if as Bars, uh, Viola said, the BARS search were actually, the, the first detection was, I think, uh, yes. BARS, uh, was a BARS detection before then uh, CBC um, detection. But it's, yeah. it's also more complex to understand, so it's many reasons why we choose to discuss this uh, mainly. Okay, so there are many other questions, but it's very um, late. So I suggest to those that have written directly to me in the chat to instead uh, copy their question on ask.eguin.org in the appropriate topic that I've sent by email and I copied at the beginning of the lecture in the chat. And uh, we, we, in the sense, me, the mentors, uh, maybe Viola, if she has time, we will have uh, um, a look and a reply offline to your uh, question. So um, I think now it's the good moment to thanks 